Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Sundays at 7. Somebody just said to me outside, Sundays at 7, it's much better when it's a dark night. I said, I don't know why, but it creates more of a, an intimacy and so on. I, I think I know what they mean. My name's David. I'm your host for Sundays at 7. It's an evening of conversation. It's an interview with a Christian who has a story to tell about her life, about how God has worked in her life. I'd encourage you, when the evening's finished, to end by having tea or coffee where you came in where the drinks were before, or you can stay in here and have a chat, particularly with our guest. Before I mention our guest and bring her out for this evening, I want to tell you about another event next Saturday. Next Saturday at half past seven, we have a concert in here called Upton Remembers. You may have noticed when you came in tonight, if not, please have a look when you leave. On the corner of the church, there is a huge wooden cross adorned with knitted red poppies. Those poppies extend over the lich gate and around the wall. There's 1,564 poppies representing the 1,564 days of the First World War. People spent an enormous amount of time making those poppies. Taxis, cars are stopping to look. But that's only half of it. On Saturday evening, we're having the Wirral Community Choir here, which is about 80 to 100 strong. They're going to be here for a concert called Upton Remembers. The first part will be songs going back to the time of the First World War and the second part with more modern songs. There will be an opportunity for you to sing as well. The tickets for the event are five pounds each. We've sold quite a few, but there's still plenty left. It's the last of our big six events to celebrate 150 years of this church being here. It's a one-off opportunity to praise God, to thank God for this church, and to remember. So that's next Saturday evening, the 10th at 7.30. Paul Edden will be at the door. He'll see he's got these green tickets, which are for the event. If you haven't got the money tonight, if you want to come along, he will let you have the tickets anyway. But try and come next Saturday evening if you can. Tonight's guest. Tonight's guest has traveled up today, uh, Penny. She's traveled up with her husband, Kevin, from the Cotswolds. They don't live far from Cheltenham. Penny is a singer and leader of a gospel community choir called Out of the Ashes. She became a Christian many years ago, and throughout her life, there have been a number of ups and downs. And there's been times when she's got very, very, very angry with God over why things are happening the way they are. Haven't we all? It'll be interesting to listen to her story and her take on why things happen and how we can deal with them. She's going to sing a couple of songs for us to start the evening and then another song in the break between the two halves of the interview. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Penny Lyon. Just leave me water there. Now, hopefully I won't forget it at the end of the evening, which would be my normal style, but um, we live in hope. Thank you so much for making me feel so welcome. Kevin and I have felt incredibly special today. We, we actually had afternoon tea in Chester at the, Gro the Grosvenor. Was it the Grosvenor? Chester Grosvenor. And I don't think I've ever had such good artist refreshments in my life as we've had this afternoon. This evening, I think it's incredibly special to come here to see what you've done with your church and to feel the presence of God among us. And I'm very conscious that sometimes we arrive, we're tired. We've been doing whatever we've been doing that day. 
the world has been a really busy place. And sometimes God's saying, just talk to me, spend some time with me. And I heard this great description by Pete Gregg of prayer and spending time with our Father. It shouldn't be hard work. We often feel prayer is hard work. And getting people to attend prayer meetings can be really hard work. But that's actually not what God wants it to be. He wants it to be us going into him, climbing onto his knee, and telling him everything. So this first song, do you want to switch the heat on? This first song is called Just Breathe. And I want you to imagine you're in a garden and you've just climbed onto God's knee. And I want you to breathe in and out. And just enjoy how much God loves you. I see you worry, I see you struggle, I see you fighting all the live long day. The floor you pacing, ooh, what a matter. It's not my plan for you to live that way, just breathe. In the middle of your turbulent seas, take a little time to get over yourself. Let the icebergs melt, spend a little time. Spend a little time with me mm -mm. In the morning, you tell you're chasing It's such a strain for you to make ends meet mm -mm. Candle burning, you're still pacing Won't you stop and rest and stay your feet Oh, won't you breathe Just a while Just grow, spend a little time, take a little time with me. Mm -hmm. Take off your hat and coat and rest easy. Lay down those tight blues and warm your aching bones. And my love for you, you'll find this breathing thing comes free. Thank you very much. Um, Peter, Nigel, is the video running? There should be a video running, hopefully. Is that meant to be a problem at our end or a problem at the other end? Or do we ignore it? Well, ignore it. It's fine. Oh, is it running fine? Stop worrying, Mr. Washburn. Thank you. 
Right, okay. It, we had to choose three songs for tonight, and that's quite a challenge because we've just written our fourth album, so we've got about 50 songs, and it's always that balance of what you choose. But we wanted to give you a few things that kind of encapsulate what Out of the Ashes is about. And we started Out of the Ashes in 2012, but we'll hear a little bit more about that story in a bit, talking to David. But this next song was written as an, because it was inspired by a story we ha- heard from the Bible Belt, if you will, in the States. Now, the Bible Belt can be a very uncomfortable place to be if you're not a Christian, and actually if you're not quite a, a right-wing Christian also. So if you're Muslim in the Bible Belt, it is a hard, unwanted place to be. And there was a particular group that wanted to build a new Muslim community center. And there was name calling and there was spitting on the streets and there was a lot of unkindness and a lot of threats being made until the pastor of Heartsong Methodist Church in Tennessee put up a sign outside his church saying, Heartsong Methodist Church welcomes our new Muslim neighbors. Now, that was enough of a surprise for the Muslims, but it was a lot bigger surprise when they then received a phone call from Steve Strong saying, come, we're going to have a barbecue on Sunday. We will make sure there's halal meat available. Come, join us, be friends. Now, Steve Strong then had a a war on his hands because his church were outraged because these were Muslims, and we're Christians, and never the twain shall meet. And Steve Strong had to go one by one to individuals within his church and sit down and show them the Gospels and show them what Jesus said about love. We should love our neighbors regardless. We keep loving. We don't stop loving. It is the background music throughout the Gospels. And one by one, he turned these people to come back to church and to realize that we're put here to be beacons to love the rest of the world. Then, Ramadan came round, and the community center was not ready. And so they said, okay, come and use our community center at our church. Use the church hall, it'll be fine. A few more eyebrows raised. And then you find that they're, they're doing Ramadan and they've got the cross on the wall behind them. And no longer are there two groups of people like this at each other. There are two groups of people who are friends. And if you want to lead people to Christ, you do it through friendship. Finally, somebody was talking to the head of CNN News. He said, why do you never put good news up? And the head of CNN News said, Show me some good news and we'll put it up. And he said, come and have a look what's happening in Hartsong in Tennessee. And the next thing is it's going all around the world on, on CNN News. And it got the, the, the script going along the bottom, talking about these two communities that have come together and are friends. This was seen in India. Three men sitting, drinking their cha around a television in India. And one of them looked up and said, but I didn't realize that Christians liked us. I thought they hated us. I thought they wanted to bomb us. Steve Strong is out mowing his lawn Saturday morning. He's got a day off. Vicars and pastors don't get many days off. You might not realize this. They don't work only on Sundays. Just going to say that. And he's mowing, and he gets a phone call long distance from India. And it's one of these three men. And he said, we've gone out, we have cleaned the anti-Christian graffiti off our church. And if you promise to continue to be kind to our Muslim brothers and sisters, we will protect your Christian brothers and sisters here. So we wrote this song because once again we're reminded that Jesus tells us to love, love, and love again, regardless of what differences we feel we have with somebody. It's called Love Your Neighbor. You gotta love, love your neighbor As you love, love yourself If they take your last penny You gotta give your shit as well If you're looking for America Get down in the dust We gotta love, love each other
it's okay Falling the Bible apart Argue whether women really should be ordained When the truth is deep in our hearts If we spare a thought, if we open our mind There's one big lesson that we gotta find We gotta love, love your neighbor Ask your love, love yourself If they take the lost penny You gotta give your shit as well Thank you very much indeed. Am I allowed to sit down now? Thank you. Penny, welcome. Thank you. Lovely to not just hear what you were singing, but the stories behind it as well. But we're going to talk about other things about you and about your life and how. God has worked in your life. Your history is you're the youngest of four children. You grew up on a farm in Dorset. What was it like being the youngest of four children? And where are your brothers and sisters now? Um, okay. Well, the thing, the thing about being the youngest is that everybody sees you as a spoilt brat, but actually you're the one that gets bossed around most. I'm sure that's experience that's shared with a lot of people here. So I learned to be quite resilient because um, I had quite a hard time for my brothers and sisters. But also, I was, my, my brothers and sisters were packed off to boarding school, which was the thing that was done in those days, which they hated. But God really looked after me because I was ill through most of my childhood, which meant that I couldn't go to boarding school, which was a serious result. So, um, so yeah, I stayed at home, which probably increased the resentment, if mm -hmm. truth be known. But, uh, yes. Three of your brothers and sisters, or two of them are alive and one, one has died, is that I right? I have two other sisters who are both alive, um, and I have a brother who died in 1995 from a car crash. Yes. Oh, dear. When we chatted, you made a comment to me which was growing up on a farm meant you didn't have to give the slightest passing nod to health and safety. I think, I think that was more the time of growing up on it. I think if you grew up on a farm nowadays, it'd probably be very different. But I remember as a child, I've heard other people say this, I could go out the door, I could say that my mother w would know where I was, 
if she wasn't too busy doing something else to not think about it. I would climb hay bales. I would go and spend time in the woods. I would mm. climb on tractors, climb onto combine harvesters. I had a great time. And it was safe. And it, it was a lot safer than the picture is painted to be. I mean, I fell out of haystacks pretty regularly and I never got hurt. So mm. yeah, I think we're a little bit overprotected nowadays probably. Obviously, very happy time for you with fond memories, especially family tea times when you were eight or nine years of age. You also mentioned how incredibly funny your dad was. Tell me about your early memories of your dad. Um, I think it, it's interesting, isn't it? Dad and tea time seem to go together. Tea time's that extra meal, which is kind of optional in so many households. But living on a farm um, with parents that worked extremely hard, I think they needed quite a lot of food. Um, and so there would be tea time. It, it would be bread first. You're not allowed cake until you've had bread. Um, and you can have jam on your bread, but you've got to have bread first. Um, and cake and huge teapot, an enormous teapot. It was about that high, this teapot. It took sort of two hands to lift it. We were very proud of the family teapot. Um, and lots of wild chatter, great sense of humor from everybody. Lots of laughter, uncontrollable paroxysms of laughter. Is that the right word? Can you have a paroxysm I of laughter? I think you can. I think that's okay. Um, and my father did a great impression of, can I do my father's impression of a seal? Oh, 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 oh. That's, uh, for some reason, this would actually send me over the edge when I was eight. <laughs> there is, as you know, a particular reason for asking you about the happy times with your dad. I mentioned before that during your life, there's been many ups and downs. And I asked you about your dad then, because when you were nearly 16, tragedy struck your family when your dad committed suicide. Yeah. Can you share with me what happened and, and how it affected you all? The thing is, I was 15. Um, I was just coming up to my 16th birthday. And I was, uh, I think at 15, we can probably be fairly, I think it's a hard time being a teenager. And we become quite self-interested. And I think I was as self-interested as any teenager can be. And so I don't think I was aware of how incredibly unhappy my father was. Um, I knew by this time, he was, he was clearly angry all the time. Um, he and my mother were clearly arguing a lot all the time. But I never looked further to actually wonder why that might be. And maybe it would have been too scary for me to actually think about my, why that might be. And it was only subsequently, when I looked back, I realized how incredibly unhappy he'd been. Um, I'm sure there are farmers here tonight. Farming is an incredibly lonely it's a struggle as an industry. You've got everybody telling you how to do things. And you just want to do a good job and look after your animals and look after your land. And you're tied up in rules. I remember they had um, an overdraft that would buy a good country house nowadays. Um, it was a, a huge overdraft. And Daddy was desperate to sell the farm. And my mother who came from a background of women, did as they were told, and stayed quiet, was not that kind of woman. She was a woman that had gone seal hay and she wanted a career, she wanted to own a farm, it had always been her ambition to own a farm. And she, when daddy t was wanting to take that dream away from her, she couldn't do it. So, and, and of course, there were no ultimatums, there were no choices. It was just a case of, as far as he was concerned, the only thing he could do was take himself out of the equation. Had she known that that was what he was thinking of doing, maybe the outcome would have been different. Who knows? What, um, could you tell me what happened? Um, we used to live in Dorset, halfway between Dorchester and Bridport, and Daddy had a sailing dinghy, which he kept at Portland Harbour. And every Thursday, it was his release. It was his day off. And he would go and he would take his sailing dinghy out. Um, now, that's just along from, I think it's Bovingdon, 
No, it's not Bovington. But, but anyway, there was, there was a marine target practice area, a military target practice area. And um, that afternoon, I received a telephone call from a complete stranger asking if Mr. Leon was there. And the moment somebody says Leon, you know that they don't know us because, of course, our surname is Lion. And we had this bit of toing and froing where he's very cautiously trying to find out where my father is. And it was very strange, and I at 15 knew this was a seriously strange conversation. And I am trying to find out who this strange man is that's asking these strange questions. And then just, and I'm sort of joking, saying, well, if he's not back by eight o'clock, there's going to be trouble because my aunt's coming to supper. Um, and he didn't laugh. There was no humor there, which also seemed strange. That was, this, was, this man was stressed. Um, and then I said, look, I'll get my mother to call you back. Or no, he said, I'll call later. And I said, well, mum will be in in about an hour's time. Fine, I'll call her then. And then fin suddenly he said, does he own a boat called the Crystal? And I said, well, Christelle, yes. And he said, right, thank you. And that was the end of the conversation. This was strange enough for me to tell my mother. My mother phones the number back, and it turned out to be the Coast Guard trying to find my father yeah. because they'd found the boat. Yeah. Simple as that, yeah. When you told me about this, you said... And we were all riddled with guilt. What could, could you explain that to me? Suicide is the most aggressive way of losing one's life there is. Suicide hurts a huge number of people because everybody is left thinking, what could I have done? Yeah. How could I have stopped that yeah. happening? So Daddy had four children all thinking, what could I have done? What could I have done? Um, and he had a wife, bless her, who was looking at herself and going, I caused that for the rest of her days. She was looking at herself going, I caused that. So it was huge, absolutely huge, absolutely huge for the development of my brothers, my brother and my, three si my two sisters. Um, and I look at, James of course has died, but I look at Joe and Sue and I see the scars. Mm -hmm. They have never got over that. As life developed as well, you actually are the only person who's a Christian in your yeah. family, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. 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 How did your mum cope with that time? And what happened to her afterwards? Um, mum died two years ago, frankly, a very angry woman. Really? Um, as far as she was concerned, she had a choice. She either didn't believe in God or she blamed him. Um, which I think is the way a lot of us go in the case of grief. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I actually don't know where she ended up, wh whether she blamed him or she just decided she didn't believe in him. I suspect she blamed him. Yeah. Um, and she was hurt, and she pointed that hurt in all sorts of ways at all sorts of people. Mm -hmm. So she became very resentful, very difficult. At the age of 15, I mean, this is around the time when this happened, trying to cope with a dreadful family tragedy, you were hugely supported um, by a school friend, uh, Ruth. She invited you to church and has been a kind of uh, spiritual guy rope ever since. Tell me a little bit about her. Well, uh, Ruth and I had been to junior school together as well, uh, and we actually hadn't liked each other at junior school. Um, and we became friends, perhaps a little bit before mm. Daddy died, I, but we became a lot closer um, in my mid, probably when I was about 13 or 14. Um, and she invited me to her church, which was an Assemblies of God church in Dorchester. Um, my mother was horrified because we were, we were what, I don't know, is anybody here familiar with the hatchings, matchings, dispatchings term of I Christianity? We were a hatchings, matchings, dispatching family. Um, you wrote Church of England on any documentation, but it didn't mean you were a Christian. I don't believe in that Christian stuff, but I'm Church of England. Um, and that was very much where we were. So when I went to this Assemblies of God church that sang choruses and came to speak in tongues, all sorts of things, she was horrified, bless her. But, sorry, Ruth. Ruth... I, m my son has now got a friend like this 
who may not loom particularly large in their life all their time. They're not in each other's pockets. Ruth and I weren't in each other's pockets. But just every so often, there would be a phone call or there would be a conversation and she would just remind me that I was a princess in God's eyes, that I was one of his children and I shouldn't lose sight of that. And it, and it felt like a guy, guy rope. It, mm. it wasn't a constant, huge impact. It was just there, just a reminder. We all need, don't are. we, somebody? Yeah. You know, just can be there. Very for powerful. Us. Yeah. 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 When I ask you about becoming a Christian, I mean, some people say to me, you know, I was taken to a service and I was called to the front and I gave my life. Other people say, I've never known any difference. There's all kinds of different ways. But for you, you tell me that um, making a lifelong commitment to Jesus has been a gradual process for you but you recognized that death is part of life, but Jesus always sends a comforter. Can you expand on that? Right, okay, well let's start off with the, the journey to Christ. Um, I have always, I, I, if I look back at my life, I feel as though God has had his hand on me every step of the way. As a seven-year-old, I knew that I had a loving father to go to. If I'm honest, I didn't really get what Jesus Christ was about in this relate. I just didn't get the whole Jesus thing. Who's Jesus? Um, and I remember seeing a, a book in the school library about is Jesus God? And I thought, God, how dare he suggest that he's God? And um, it was only later on I read, no, Jesus really is God. And I actually had to steer my perceptions a little bit. Um, we had a great aunt Rose. Great aunt Rose was a family friend. I don't think she was actually a relative, but every Christmas there would be a present sent from great aunt Rose. And it'd be something really small. It would be a coat hanger, you know, a special knitted coat hanger or something small that she had made. I never met her. I don't know, didn't know what she looked like. And if I look back at my relationship with God through those early years, I think it was a bit like my relationship with Great Aunt Rose, that I knew she was there. I had a picture, I pictured her wearing pink, bony ankles, um, elderly lady, white hair, very kindly. That was my picture. I pictured God, blue gown, big white beard, sitting in heaven. And I think Rose would have liked a little bit more from me than the odd thank you letter every year, just as I think God would have liked a little bit more from me than arrow prayers mm. in times mm. of emergency. Um, and what has happened is that along the way, through the ups and downs, as he has so palpably been there, that I have drawn closer and closer and closer, and my picture of him has developed Have you always had a passion for singing? Um, what, what is your career history? Career history. Um, left, well, of course, Daddy died um, just before my A-levels. So my A-levels actually did die form. Um, so I didn't, I, I, and I planned on being a doctor when I was doing my A-levels. And then I walked out with three very scraped levels. I was very proud that I managed to scrape my A-levels on, on zero revision. Um, and then it's kind of, what do you do now? Now, I got a job with Marks & Spencer. I worked in the underwear department of children's underwear of Marks & Spencer, um, which was actually very good for me because they grounded me quite well and they taught me to be a bit more organized than I was. But then I found my way into marketing and it was just by a series of events and I became marketing director for a design company which suited me really well because it involved a lot of talking brilliant <laughs> makes me very happy yeah. um, I'm trying to remember where the question went from there there was a bit more to this question Your career history career history so so marketing director of a design company stopped work when I was 40 um, because my beloved husband um, was able to sell his business and take early retirement and he was working less than I was and I got jealous Is that a bad thing? I said, I'm sorry. I don't want to work anymore. I want to work in my garden, please. So I stopped then okay. <laughs> In the second part, yes. I'd like to talk to you about Kevin 
about your son James and how the Lord has helped you through many upsetting times over the years. But before that, would you like to tell us what you're going to sing? You're going to sing another song for us. Okay, we're going to sing a final song. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. It's a hands up moment. How many people here remember that when you were 15, you, well, there are a few people that aren't 15 here yet, but those of us that are a little bit older, how many of you remember that when you were 15, you didn't believe you would ever grow old? Hands up. My hand goes straight up. I think we have to be candid here, don't we? And the thing was, of course, I was 15, and, and if somebody had said to me, you're going to be old one day too, I'd have said, yeah, and tomorrow morning I'm going to wake up and I'll be a panda bear because old was a completely different species just as being a panda bear was a completely different species. And, of course, you get to 20, and 20 is cool. And you get to 25, and 25, I'm sorry, but it's even cooler. And then you get to 30, the big th people start talking about the big 3-0, or the big 4-0. The big and then, of course, you get to the big 5-0. And 5-0 is, I think, what was once 25. 5-0 is pretty cool now, as far as I can make out. And the big 6-0 is, is the new 30. But when I got to the big 5-0, I thought, the way I'm going to cope with the big 5-0 is by reminding myself that when I get to the big 6-0, the big 5-0 is going to look really young, so I might as well just get on with it. Are you following me? The thing is, when I got to 54, I was standing in front of the mirror in the bathroom and realizing for the first time that this age thing was actually real, this was going to happen to me, which I hadn't believed really until then. And I was contemplating the ruins of my face, and thinking, what do I do? Do I get surgery? No, it's expensive and it hurts. Um, do I dye my hair? No, I'm far too lazy. I'm far too lazy. Makeup? Well, yeah, okay, on special occasions when I'm going to St. Mary's at Upton and things like that, I can do that. But apart from that, I found it quite scary. And as I said, my mum was an angry woman by this time. And I didn't want to go where mum was going. And I was panicking in front of the bathroom mirror. And I felt God over my shoulder. And he said, do you know what? I really love the lines on your face. I really love your gray hair. Gray hair is an honor, not a disgrace. It is a crown of glory. That completely threw me. And at that point, he then said, and now I've got some work for you to do. So Kevin and I go out into churches, and our whole ministry is to tell people who might believe that they're not being heard anymore, might believe that actually from 30 onwards that there might not be much more for them to do. And God is saying, the more you've got behind you, the more you have got that you can do for me. So we wrote this song, and it's called Ain't Done Yet, because that's what it's all about. was past the time when the burning bush was set on fire. Down would come six hundred feet when the water began to rise. Use the light when you ain't done yet. Use the light when you ain't done yet. Use the light when you ain't done yet. So get up out that chair. When Joshua marched on Cana, the man was way past seventy-five.
you ain't done yet a retirement plan but you ain't done yet you got books to read but you ain't done yet get out that shed get off that bed if you're breathing still There's some people here who have uh, passed the big seven though as well, you know. And is God using them? Mm -hmm. And is well, God using them? Yeah, absolutely. Precisely. There you go. Feeling better already. <laughs> <laughs> Penny, 16 years ago, your son James was born. Yeah. Kevin, new, absolutely delighted. And you very much wanted more children. But due to an extraordinary number of miscarriages, it just didn't happen. You told me that our faith in God is tested day by day by day, and that's how we grow. But can you put into words the trauma of all that's happened to you and how you got through it all? Okay. Um, as you said, um, J James was there now, and actually James was ill, which of course exacerbated the situation. Um, we weren't absolutely sure that we were going to have a 16-year-old James to celebrate. And that's possibly part of the reason that I had the problems that I had. But I felt I was on a promise. I felt as though I, I pictured, we have these pictures for our lives, don't we? And my picture for my life was three children, was Kevin and three children and me. That was what I pictured. And I felt I was on a promise. I felt that God was going to give me this. And I became pregnant, and we were celebrating, and it was that wonderful feeling of being pregnant. And then at 16 weeks, we lost the baby. And you pick yourself up, you brush yourself off, and I became pregnant again. And I thought, this'll be it, this'll be it. And each time I became pregnant, it, this was the one. So by the 10th time, I was furious. And we came back from hospital, and I took myself off for a bath. And it's like, I always think the description of licking one's wounds is such a good description. And I went and I shut the door, and I remember saying to God, I know I'm meant to pray, but quite frankly, I don't know that I even want to speak to you. I really don't think I like you very much at the moment. And of course, I knew that this, now, this probably was too late for me to become pregnant again. I was 50. And I got into my bath, and I'm, you know, puffy eyes, blotchy face, I'm not looking good. And the kindness that God showed me was just extraordinary. And I was, I, you know, I was being honest with him. Let's not make any bones about it. I was cross, and I wanted God to know how cross I was. And he showed me this picture of Jesus Christ coming to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And there are throngs of people waving palm fronds, singing hosannas, celebrating because they have got their picture i had my picture but their picture was that this was their messiah this was the promised davidic king that was spoken about in isaiah who was going to knock the romans off the pinnacle and was going to put the jews back on top they knew what it was all about as far as they were concerned and of course what actually happened is in the space of a week he was betrayed he was arrested he was humiliated, and he was crucified. And I think we always hear about that there was somebody going, come on, get yourself off the cross, see if you can get yourself out of this, come on. If you're God, then see if you can do this. But I think there were people going, come on, get yourself off the cross. Because they had seen what Jesus could do. 
They had heard him speak, and he said nothing in his own defense. They had seen him raise people to life, and he did nothing to save his own life. They had seen him heal people, and he did nothing to get himself off that cross. And they couldn't understand. And of course, we get what Jesus Christ was about. We get what he was doing for us. And that's what God said. He said, look, he said, we get, you get what Jesus was doing. You get that this was the greatest miracle that I could have done. He said, but they didn't. They didn't have a clue. For them, this was a broken promise. Mm. And he said, what you've got to do, just as they had to trust me, you've got to trust me. And I hate the pain that you're going through. And I'm sorry for what is happening. It is not of my wishes. But you've got to trust me. And what then happens over the ensuing months, it's a bit like a husband and wife who've had a major row where you start grunting at each other after a few days and you, you, you occasionally make a almost polite, rather than just slamming the door in their face, you actually, there's the odd grunting comes and gradually maybe you allow yourself to touch their hand when you're driving or whatever. And I was a little bit like my restoration of my relationship to God. But I remember reaching a point where I knew I had a choice do I carry on without the loving God that I have always known? Or do I accept this and move forward and move forward in his grace? And it was a, a definitive moment of having a choice mm. and realizing that I had to move forward. And at that point, my relationship with God was able to move forward extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily. And the thing that I find fascinating I don't want to live through what we went through again. But I wouldn't change it. Because so much that has strengthened me, encouraged me, helped me to grow, has come from that pain mm -hmm. that Kevin and I went through, which I find extraordinary. Thank, thank you for sharing that with all of us. Let's talk about James. He's just had his 16th birthday you said he was ill when he was young yeah um james ha had well what we were aware of was very very severe eczema um so he looked like a burns victim all over his whole body he was just a weeping sore over his whole body um which made life very hard because he couldn't sleep he just wanted to scratch so the only way we could help him sleep was to tie his hands to his side. This is horrific, sorry. Tie his hands to his side and tie him to the bed because otherwise he would wake up in the night attacking himself and hence screaming. So you had to restrain him. Um, and of course that turned to asthma and then it turned out that he had um, a lot of very severe allergies. And I remember coming back from hospital when he was three, having just had a very severe anaph anaphylaxis. Um, and they'd done a lot of RAS tests, which are the allergy tests that they can do. And the consultant said, this is the most allergic child I have ever seen. And I remember Kevin and I looking at each other and thinking, how do we get him through to adulthood? Because the thing that was made clear to me is that repeated um, exposure to the things that they're allergic to Get the results get worse and worse and worse. Well, this had been bad enough. So how are we going to get him through? And frankly, we were exhausted. I mean, when you've got a child of that kind of health level, you get about two hours sleep a night. Um, and I remember sitting by the cot. You know, I was a barely functioning mother. We all had this picture. It, we, we, s we see these pictures of the kind of mothers we want to be. They're on sanatogen adverts and things of that sort. Um, and I had this picture of the kind of mother I wanted to be, and I promise you, I wasn't. I was a, f a barely functioning mother that was changing nappies, was... I couldn't cuddle my child because he was a weeping sore. So if I picked him up, I had to pick him up from behind, and I couldn't let his face come against me because I would damage him. Um, so all your sort of relationship stuff goes out the window. 
And I was sitting by the cot one night. It is three o'clock. Um, Kevin was far better than I was at waking up. I was very good at sleeping through all sorts of things, which as a mother is another comment, actually, on what kind of mother you were at the time. Um, and I was sitting by the cot, and I just wanted this child to go back to sleep. I just wanted sleep. Yes, I wanted him better, but right now, I just wanted sleep. And you can get become desperate enough for sleep, I think, for that to become the way it goes. And I'm sitting by the cot with this screaming little boy, and I'm just saying, come on, God, surely you can heal this. You can sort this out. You can put this right. Make him better. And he didn't seem to. And there were a group of friends that were also praying for James, and he was... It, it was, it, 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 there was a lot of awareness within the community of, of the difficulties that Jamie was having um, and we were having. And it was only when Jamie got to eight, we weren't sleeping through yet, but we were, we were in a lot better state than we had been. And I suddenly looked back and realized that no, God hadn't done the instant, miraculous, everything's solved, everything's better. But what he'd done is he'd breathed on us. And I, I love the way God breathes on us. In our worst situations, if we invite him to breathe on us, if we invite the Holy Spirit in, it is extraordinary what will happen. And, if, and when I was able to look back with some clarity at the situation, I realized that there were people around us who were supporting us. There were people praying for us. We were in a situation where we didn't have to get up at six o'clock in the morning to go to work. We were able to both be there. We had family around us that were able to give us breaks and were supportive and were kind and were helpful. Um, we, we got through James's eczema and asthma without using steroids um, because we knew that steroids would make things ultimately worse. Um, and we had people in place that were able to help us through that process and get him. And that now if doctors look at James and go, what happened? Because he's an amazing, healthy chap. Um, and if I look at people whose children were not as ill as James, they're nowhere near as healthy as he is now. And I think that God breathes on us. He pours his Holy Spirit on us if we will let him if we will invite the Holy Spirit. And extraordinary things happen. Maybe not what we ask for. You had a really difficult eight years. Yeah. But when I asked you about James today, <laughs> it was a case of, well, where do I start? Just tell us a little bit about him today. Because I know he's the apple of your eye and he's just about everything. To quote another parent in my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Normally. Um, he, the thing is... Can I tell you what you said? You said, he's smart, he's funny, he's kind, he knows the Lord Jesus, and he's late for everything. Oh. <laughs> well, I was 42 before I managed to become pregnant, so he was late for that. He then was three weeks late coming out, so he was late for that, and then he was 36 hours in the process. And he's, uh, he, he, was in a, he went to America on a school trip. They do much gr more glamorous school trips nowadays than we used to in my day. Um, and he went to Orlando. And we were very concerned because they were going for five days. And we were worried about jet lag. And um, I said to him, he, I picked him up on the Saturday morning from school, 11 o'clock, expecting this bags under eyes, grumpy teenager. And I got this cheerful chap who was nonstop mouth going, telling me all about America and what he'd seen and space rockets and goodness knows what. And um, I said, are you not tired? And he went, no, no. Did you have jet lag when you went out? No, no, no. Well, let's face it, mum, I don't have any awareness of time, so it wasn't going to be a problem, was it? <laughs> <laughs> so that's James. Good. I want to talk a little bit more about this thing about being angry with God. I've heard many times people say, I was angry with God. It's not good, you know. It's not right to be angry with God. We've no right to be angry with God because everything is for a purpose. And other people would say, I was so angry and I had nobody else to go to. 
You once wrote in an article that during your many disappointments, you became very angry with God in allowing your hopes to be raised and then dashed again. Mm -hmm. Angry at wasted time, angry at wasted plans, and your faith was rocked to its foundations. What did Jesus make clear to you through the events that lifted you out of this? You mentioned Palm Sunday, but I just suspect there's a little more of that because you can be consumed with anger, can't you? I think you can be consumed with anger if you don't express it, actually. Uh, now, I'm talking off the top of my head here. So, Holy Spirit, please do what you do. Um, if we, let's look at our own marriages. If we don't, if we aren't honest with our partner, with our loved one, can we expect to have a good marriage? We have to be honest with another, one another. And God wants us to see us. He wants us to see him as daddy. This is Abba Father. Abba means daddy. It doesn't mean distant person on a throne that I'm never allowed to approach. It means daddy. It is that level of intimacy that we are enabled to have through Jesus Christ. And it's through Jesus Christ and God wants us to be able to be that close to him that we can approach him, we can climb into his lap, we can tell him what hurts us, we can tell us how we feel he has hurt us if we feel he has hurt us. And that enables him to then tell us how much he loves us. And I don't believe I would have had that clarity of how much God loved me if I hadn't been that honest yeah. at that moment. And I think you're right. I think a huge number of us hold our anger in because we're not entitled to express it. But I think that's also an era thing. Um, I meet an awful lot of people, both men and women, who don't feel they are entitled to receive. It's that whole chin up, stiff up a lip. Um, I don't count, you're more important. And actually, Jesus doesn't say that. And he says, love your neighbor as yourself. He doesn't say love your neighbor more than yourself. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. You've got to love yourself too. And you've got to realize that before God, we are princes and princesses. Mm. We are inheritors mm. and what he gives us. And we are so unbelievably precious. And I think that the reason we have children is to give us a clue, just a clue, of how precious we are to God. And actually, I'm going to say just a little bit more, um, because we were talking about answered prayer and non-answered prayer, and I think God has three answers to prayer. One is yes, one is wait, and I think the third one's probably you must be joking. <laughs> and James saved up for a remote control aeroplane. And I was watching him and Kevin flying this thing for the first time. And Kevin is a superb father. And he was trying to say, James, keep it out of the trees. You know, watch my lips, James. Keep it away from the trees because you won't get it back. And I was standing watching thinking, we're going to lose this wretched airplane. It's been months in the coming. We're going to lose the wretched thing. And I knew, because James wasn't listening to Dad, I knew that what I would not be able to do if he lost that plane, I would not be able to step in and say, we'll get you another one. Because James had to learn the lesson. And it was one of the... Of, thank you, Lord, he didn't fly it into a tree and I didn't have to face it. But... I suddenly realized how it must feel to God to say no to us. But he also knows that he needs to say no to us. He can't, we're, here, we're living here in a broken world and he can't just keep fixing it because we have got to learn ourselves about being mature Christian adults before God. Does that make sense? Yeah. Penny, you've been through many ups and downs. I mean, there was a terrible issue over your dad 
the problem with James and his illness for eight years, the awful trauma of a miscarriages. Is Penny Lyon in a good place today? Absolutely. And actually, one of the th things that, I mean, I feel so loved. I get to come and sing, and I get to tell stories about God. Um, if I wasn't able to do this, he would have somebody else to replace me in a heartbeat. But he chooses me to do it. And I just find that incredible, absolutely incredible. That such a privilege. Um, I'm living with an amazing man. I have an amazing child. I have amazing friends, and I have an amazing, amazing Father in Heaven who is with me moment by moment. And each time I invite him in, there he is. There he is. Absolutely incredible. We've listened to your story. We've listened to you sing. We appreciate you being here, and Kevin as well. You've actually brought some, um, you, you're involved with, I mentioned, Out of the Ashes, and you brought some merchandise with you tonight over there. What exactly have you got? Just we've tell us briefly. We've got three CDs. Um, the first CD, 2012. Uh, the second CD, 2014. The third CD, um, which is called Fear, Secrets and Lies, is 2015, 16, 2016. Um, and we just actually produced our fourth CD, but that's not on sale yet. So we've got three CDs there. We've also some got some T-shirts, for those of you that feel that you need more T-shirts, um, with Out of the Ashes, Still Breathing, Ain't Done Yet, written on the back, a little challenge for the world. What's these uh, little boxes? These little boxes. I think this is what God's done in my life, and this is what he wants done in everybody's life. There's a little boy who lives in Galilee. And he's heard that there is this man going around, telling stories, doing miracles, healing people. He's heard that he's raised some people from the dead. I mean, just incredible stories. And then he hears somebody say he might be the messiah you know i think he might be the messiah and some people are saying yeah he's he's something else they're all saying different things about him but everybody's talking about this man and then he hears that this man is down on the beach at galilee and he goes and he finds his mum. he says mum mum can i can i go and hear him i want to hear him speak please can i go he says okay three conditions one all your chores are done properly Two, I don't want to hear that you're misbehaving at all. You go, you come back. I don't want to hear any stories about how you behaved down there. And three, you've got to be back by sundown. I don't want to be worrying about you. So this little boy, he goes, shoot at the shoots around super quick time, gets all his chores done really well because he doesn't want to have to do anything again. And he goes back to his mum and says, Mum, Mum, I've done everything. Can I go, please? Can I, can I, can I? She said, okay, and I've made you a packed lunch. What was in the packed lunch? Loaves and fishes. And he goes down to the Sea of Galilee, and he's on the beach. And we, hear, we read in the Bible that there were 5,000 people there. But that was just the men, because women and children didn't count in ancient Israel. It was just the men. So there were thousands upon thousands of people there. And there was Jesus in the middle of it, and they're all trying to hear him. And this little boy's life is changed that day. A whole new direction. Because he has seen unbelievable kindness. He has realized for the first time that he is precious, which is a child in ancient Israel you never heard. And he's, he's held all day. But then he realizes the sun is starting to get lower and he's going to have to go home. He's very reluctant, but he's going to have to go. And then Jesus says, we've got to feed these people. Has anybody got any food? Now you can imagine it, can't you? Hand goes straight up. Yeah, yeah, I've got some, I've got some. Me, here, here. And then he suddenly realizes he's the only hand that has gone up. In that crowd, nobody else has got any food. And it's worse because all he's got is a couple of fish or five fish and a couple of loaves. 
And it's worse because he's a child and children shouldn't push themselves forward. And now he's blushing, he's got a bit pink, he's a bit embarrassed. And some people beside him are laughing at him and say, oh, for goodness sake, what's he got? What good's he going to do? And he wishes he could hide. And so many of us just want to hide. But Jesus took everything he had. He went forward. He didn't hide. He gave it all to Christ. And with that, one of the greatest miracles in the Bible was done. It's told in all four of the Gospels. It's the only story that's in all four of the Gospels. Now, all of us have stuff in our lives. We're too old, we're too young, we're too fat, we're too thin, too stupid, too clever, too black, too white. You name it, we've all got it. And Jesus is saying, whatever you have, whoever you are, give me what you have and I will feed thousands with it. Each one of us here can feed so many people, not just with food, with spiritual bread and spiritual water. This box contains ash, um, and we give them away if anybody wants to take one, or if anybody wants to take six because they want to encourage somebody else. This is such an important message. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, Penny Lyon. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You made us feel so welcome. Thank you. And can I say, if you want to talk to me afterwards, please do come and chat to me. If you've got further questions, because I've waffled happily for no, hours you haven't. long. No, you have with, with, with the very wise David. But if I haven't quite covered something, please feel free to ask me. I'm really, really happy to talk about all of this and anything. And now Nikki is going to come out and close in prayer. I won't be the only one to say this, but um, if you're going to come to Fiona Bruce, I'm not sure you need to bring an antique. <laughs> I can't be the only person who's going to say that, can't I? I? Say I forbid to say that. So. <laughs> um, uh, Fiona Bruce, uh, she's going to come and she's going to talk about um, all sorts of things, I think, but about the difference that faith makes, what it's like to be a Christian in Parliament, uh, what it's like to do politics, and what it's like to make a difference, or uh, where she is as uh, she sa shares faith for life in Jesus. I want to thank uh, Penny and, and Kevin for coming tonight. Thank you for uh, coming to us in Upton. Thank you for sharing your story. As you would have heard, um, as David uh, explained about the poppies and about our remembrance weekend next weekend, we at St. Mary's believe that God is here for us at all ages and stages, and he believes, we believe that he wants us to remember well lives worth talking about. And I'm particularly thrilled that you talked about your family you talked about two sisters and a brother. You talked about mum and dad, daddy, and you talked about Kevin and James, and thank you for sharing that. And uh, our prayer for you is that you will be able to breathe, that you will continue to get out of your chair, and that you will continue to encourage us to love in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to pray a breath prayer, which is one of the oldest prayers in the Bible, which is to pray for you and yours as you travel back to Cheltenham, and uh, to pray for us here, for us, our family, near and far, those that we love, uh, those that we may have remembered tonight as a result of something perhaps that Penny said. And I hope that that's been the work of the Spirit to cause us to remember well lives worth talking about. So the Lord bless you and watch over you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly on you and give you peace. And may you travel hopefully from here in the company of the Father, your Daddy, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, this night and always. Amen. <laughs>